There's been an ongoing conversation about games, often games that we really like, just, uh, you know, disappearing. Online support being pulled, no longer being able to find the single player. Also, times where developers try to do something new. They actually try to be innovative, try to go out there. But things aren't necessarily successful. Well, today, we've got the story of CCP Games. They're the people who make EVE Online. They're based in Reykjavik, Iceland. I've actually been outside their office. I've been to the monument that they have in that city, which oh, is yeah. pretty damn neat. And they're a very interesting company because obviously EVE Online is actually one of the most unique games out there. It's produced some of the greatest stories that gaming has really ever had. So many more people actually follow EVE just for the stories, even versus actually playing the game. It's all fascinating, but the thing is, they're a company who have tried so many things. I mean, take the whole, uh, like, the vampire games. Oh, yes. Originally, that was going to be them, not Paradox Interactive. Whole story there. Making moves into the FPS space multiple times. Getting into VR in a way that could have been really cool. And yet we have seen, unfortunately, constant attempts to do something new and cool, and constantly that stuff not really working out. So... Today, we do have the sad situation of Eve Valkyrie, Eve Gunjack, and Spark having their servers shut down, which unfortunately is also taking out the single player. And for these games, I mean, Gunjack, look at that, mostly positive. Spark, very positive. Valkyrie, Warzone, unfortunately, uh, a bit mixed, Man. which is kind of unfortunate. But each one of these games was a fairly interesting, and I mean, I at least played Valkyrie initially, very fun move into the virtual reality space back at a time where there was so much optimism and excitement i mean come on for valkyrie you can see those multiple kilometers big ships in eve online friggin starbuck is there as the main voice uh, character it was some pretty cool stuff yeah but it just wasn't to be it's interesting when you look at the like review numbers there they are very low they are yes. very very low even if at the very most you look at the like i think steam spy suggests like 50 times reviews is like the upper limit of like how many players will actually be there which means you're looking at like 10 20 000 for this massive mmo spin-off kind of little thing and it just seems like i would almost say this is maybe a lesson in first of all like your planning and like your marketing of stuff because i don't know how many people really know about these outside of people who are super following ccp and super following eve yeah i think the hope would have been you know, once you get into a niche and then the marketing almost does itself through word of mouth, like mm -hmm. that's one of the things in VR. And at least in those earlier days of VR, I'm, this may be bullshit, but I at least remember devs talking about how the attachment rate was decently high because straight up, there aren't that many VR games. You have a small number of people with VR headsets, but what do they want? They really want VR content. So they were generally willing to actually hop in and do that. So Eve Valkyrie was VR only in 2016. I played it on an Oculus uh, DK2 and you know what? I enjoyed it, but I was a little bit disappointed. I think what I would have wanted was more of a Wing Commander single-player game situation. They were obviously going for something uh, pretty damn different, where it's like, yeah, th those, you know, those gameplay missions, they were kind of more just like little scenes that would happen around you, I suppose. But it did actually go on to PC and PS4 without a headset in a relaunch called E Valkyrie Warzone. But you can see from the Steam Charts player numbers... They're, they're just small. Um, I mean, yeah, they're, they're just small. There's actually times where the demo for our the demo for our game is like higher than this um, at certain points, right? Which is like kind of like, you know, whoa, that's, that's a bit funky. Yeah, it's not necessarily bad for something in a niche, but I mean, at the same time, if it's not high, how do you support it? And if multiplayer is supposed to be a component, then you don't reach that critical mass. You end up in a lawbreakers-like situation, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, after six months, they are pulling it. Uh, they, they are pulling it. Uh, customer support will no longer be provided. The same thing is also happening for Spark, which is a multiplayer VR sports game, and also EVE Gunjack. And if you look at the players here, I mean, for, for Gunjack, like, you look at this graph, and then you notice that this first bar is 25 players. It barely 
got ahead of 25 now. That was, I think, what was it called? Google Glass or whatever? That was oh, one yeah. that was like more designed on phones, but it just shows that whenever it came onto Steam, it didn't really catch on. And as for Spark, unfortunately, you see this nice peak at 236, but absolutely no follow through. So this is a case where like, Look, it's unfortunate that for Valkyrie, there was the loss of the training modes, the scripted uh, missions, the free roam stuff that would, you know, you'd get like records and kind of story logs mm -hmm. in the survival mode. It would have been nice if those things uh, could have been kept. But you look at these numbers and you absolutely cannot blame them. I mean, this doesn't affect that many people overall because these were barely really played by people. And if it takes time and effort to ensure that, you know, they, they kind of are supported games that still work, like, you can understand them being pulled. But it's just an interesting thing, because it's happened to CCP games fairly often, and I think we've seen quite a few VR projects that just, you know, they, they get done, it's like, where do they go? I mean, there's the Medal of Honor VR project that came out from Respawn, and, you know, it wasn't the best received, and it doesn't seem to have made much of a hit. Quite a few companies kind of like went to do these VR experiences. I have to wonder if maybe you know, the accessibility of virtual reality on uh, you know PSVR 2, if that will maybe help get something going in the scene. But I think one of the issues that's really happened is these VR games, they often end up being tech demos with some content. And there's like a really fun game. You know, there, there is fun gameplay, but it's not beefed out with enough content. I mean, for me, that's why it really took the likes of Half-Life Alex to actually yeah. just get me properly sitting there for like 10 hours in virtual reality. Because the thing with VR is, you know, there's a bit of setup. For a lot of people, it does actually involve... I mean, it's not the most effort in the world, but maybe they need to move their sofa or move their coffee table or do something like that. And that's not really ideal, is it? Yeah, it's kind of like almost one of those things where I think there's no real super solid committal because they kind of everyone's putting their f like toes in the water instead of jumping in I think that's kind of what happened with that entire kind of ecosystem and it's obvious here when when you only when you only dip your toes in you don't expect success and that's why Alex is still like the best VR game there is because it's it took Valve going we'll give this our everything because we're Valve and we do whatever the hell we want it's like is this going to make a return fuck it we hope so Obviously, they had, you know, the whole uh, the whole Steam VR stuff to kind of incentivize it a little bit further because they wanted to push it themselves. But it's still kind of just, just an awkward situation that publishers can't seem to plan super well for the future or kind of just do stuff. Same well, time, you don't want to... Yeah. I think they'd really tried to make a measured bet into a new scene. I think they were mm. clearly excited about it. I was super excited about it at the time. To this day, I still love virtual reality. You know, Beat Saber, I, I play Ble Beat Saber, I love it. But it is just kind of challenging. And I suppose with the price increase on the uh, the Meta Quest 2, mm. oh, yeah. let's call that, with the price increase there, it's certainly going to, you know, it's going to hurt that accessibility because man, I mean, as much as the, the Valve Index is always sitting there, in the Steam, like, top selling, because, yeah. of course, the top selling in Steam is actually by, uh, I think it's, like, by revenue. Um, but that's a lot of change. It's a lot for somebody to drop. But the thing is with CCP, it's not even that, because they've really tried to go out there and be inventive with other projects. And I think so many of you will have forgotten about this, but do you remember Dust514? It was a... Barely, yes. Yeah, it was a Battlefield-inspired shooter... There was an exclusive on the PS3, launched in 2013, closed in 2016, and the idea was supposed to be that basically, you know, these kind of uh, big groups of players in, in Dust, the FPS, they would partake in planetary battles, which would hook into EVE, where like, you know, in, in EVE, you could orbital bombard a game of Dust. Like, they were really trying some pretty damn out there incredible stuff the idea that you could actually be a foot soldier in one of these big intergalactic eve bat well not intergalactic but you know these big uh space battles in eve that you could actually be a part of those power struggles you could be a small part in the story of eve because perhaps what they realized is so many players they think about eve you know for the incredible stories that come out of it but if you remember the this is eve uh, marketing campaign that i think happened in 2014 it led to humongous player spikes but not a lot of those people stayed because eve is such a challenging game to get in yeah. so maybe what they tried to do is kind of say right shooters people love them 
There's a space mm -hmm. for that happening within our universe. Way more people know about EVE and its, its world than actually want to play it. Maybe this will work. But it didn't. And that's their first FPS. But they have a second FPS called Project Nova, which actually mm -hmm. never made it out of development. And that just shows that, like... I mean, they have really been trying to turn that EVE, uh, that EVE money into something. Even within EVE Online, I mean, they did the whole thing where they made a pretty damn advanced, uh, pretty neat character creator to, mm. you know, get all the monetization for that and try to get, you know, being able to walk around the space station, have your, like, little apartment. And they, of course, eventually end up turning that off because the players didn't really like it anyway. And they just kept on trying. And they actually tried with another MMO. Yeah, it was this story, because obviously before we recorded, uh, Connor was telling me about it a little bit and talking about it, because he likes the World of Darkness stuff. And I was just sitting thinking, there is certainly big lessons from CCP in terms of what are cool ideas, that if you ask anyone on the street, be they a gamer or non-gamer, they'll go, fuck yeah, I want in on that. But then you look at the execution and go, how, the, how, how do you do that? Yeah. How is this even feasibly possible? And the I world mean, of darkness stuff was like the, the the prime of me going, I wish that worked, but would it ever have? Yeah, to do a full MMO within the world of darkness setting, you know, it almost feels like a cyberpunk situation. Because in cyberpunk, yeah. you know, there's that idea you could be a journalist, you could be a, a whatever, right? It's like there's so many fantasies to play out within that MMO setting that it ended up not being something that they did. We actually do have uh, this leaked screenshot uh, from it, but of course... What happens to that? Well, they end up selling that stuff to Paradox Interactive. Where it's done wonderfully so far. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, the whole vampire... Of course, Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines would be the thing that most people would know from the World of Darkness setting. Hmm. And sadly, Vampire uh, Blo the Masquerade Bloodlines 2 has seemingly struggled in development. It had, you know, creative leads leading, very large delays. We don't really know what's going on uh, with the project. So it's, it's kind of weird because, yes, in 2015, they sold that to Paradox. Then they moved into virtual reality that was actually backed by 30 million in venture capital, right? Like there were studios, uh, you know, actually opened to do this. This is at that stage. I mean, look at what VC is, uh, you know, is doing right now. You know, it's like the session-based multiplayer and, you know, all of those sorts of games, right? There's, mm -hmm. there's just so many multiplayer games, Um that, you know, right now are, are sort of being VC-backed. Uh, there's also the crypto space. Well, back then, it was exploring virtual reality. You know, we had those big, massive growth charts that maybe didn't come to pass as much as VR enthusiasts, like myself, would have actually wanted. And basically, at the time, you know, they talked about having a, a conservative but measured stance on the whole thing. I think very obviously wanted to stake their claim in what could potentially have been a massive new space of growth. Uh, to, to put it in the business lingo, a blue ocean's opportunity. Blue ocean, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, but of course, then uh, in 2017, they cease VR development. They close their Atlanta office that was making Spark. They sell their Newcastle studio to Sumo Digital. And uh, that actually you know, resulted in 100 layoffs. Um, but with the existing projects being maintained, that is the maintenance that now today we see has actually ceased. But overall, they're in a, a tricky situation where they've had ambition. They've tried to make things happen. But outside of EVE Online, it just hasn't. And now we're in a funny situation, you know, where there's EVE Online, where they have the whole Alpha Omega thing, uh, allowing it to be free to play, the way that they're kind of handle the skill points and all of that. There's also EVE Echoes. I can't remember whether that's Tencent or NetEase, but it's basically an EVE adaptation for mobile. But third, third time might be the charm because as of EVE FanFest, which is uh, the big convention that they hold in Reykjavik, uh, they're actually attempting a third FPS within the EVE universe. It's being handled by their London studio. I mean, persistence is the kind of the, uh, what's the term they use? Like an indicator of success, I guess. <laughs> God, hope that, I actually hope it does turn out well, because that's the thing, right? Anytime they've ever had a project, people have been excited, like palpably. There's new, like there's articles around it going, here's another thing in the beautiful Eve universe. You get to get into it, like you're saying with DOS 514. And it's like, people love the idea of Eve. People love the idea of what CCP are doing. But then it's like, well, don't really like Eve. Nothing else kind of works. So hopefully they actually do have it. Like the technological side of it might be a little bit handier now. There might be more design. There might be more space in the market. There's Because the FPS market is definitely very different 
from the Dust 5 when Ford is, because that was when they thought, you know, around the same time as MAG, where they're like, 256 players versus 256 players, this is fine. This is this is, this is the pinnacle of gameplay. What the, 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 end, the entire industry was on something in that generation. I don't know what it was, but it was very, very powerful stuff. But now you're in like a more measured place where you, if they do an FPS, they're like, right, well, let's look at some, you know, what, what does Space Tarkov look like? What does Space Tarkov look like? What kind of Battle Royale stuff can we bring into this? What's the what's the, the design elements that will actually work this time? And maybe they'll keep it out of VR. So I think VR is that okay, case so everyone's like, yeah. Anyone anyone who's a cynic at the time will go, the tech's cool, but you're never going to beat someone sitting down on the sofa and playing a game. Yeah. You're just not going to beat that because putting on a headset's another step. That's it, and that's yeah. The thing. Like, it's an effortful, sweaty experience. Sure is. Well, especially if you're playing Beat Super, but yeah. 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 And I, I do like, though, how they've talked about it, because he just said, if you look at the whole thing, it was okay. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. We got in at the right time, but we got out at the right time. Yeah. That That's it. Yeah. And uh, hopefully what they have gained is experience and knowledge. Hopefully that means that this FPS project's really good. Now that said... I definitely think it's a tall order. It's an extremely hard market to break into. Oh, for sure. I mean, that's really challenging. There is a bit of me that just wonders, you know, do they not have maybe some more expertise in the MMO spaces or maybe more they could do there? But they've had a long time struggle with EVE Online. Um, EVE's players, I don't know if they're still dwindling, but they've kind of been flattening out and really not at a particularly high level. I believe that EVE is still a very, very, you know, healthy game. It brings its money in. It definitely pays for itself and all of that stuff. But I, I just wonder. They've they've always struggled growing EVE. But is, is there something else they could do? And maybe that's what they really wanted with World of Darkness, but they weren't able to pull it off. Yeah. It's, it's challenging. Because yeah. no matter how you try to make it, you know, easier to get into EVE, it still is EVE. It's a massive, deeply intricate and complex MMORPG that is a sandbox. Now, you look at RuneScape. RuneScape's a sandbox. It's also exceedingly easy to pick up and play and get into, mm -hmm. right? And yes, <laughs> RuneScape can have a death penalty, but boy, howdy, you should see the death penalty in EVE. And I suppose that's fundamentally the challenge. You know, they, they've made a really pretty big, pretty successful niche product. How do you capitalize on that success to do cool new things? Because they sure have tried. Yeah, that's. I think that's a fun thing. That it's interesting to talk about this publisher in general because you kind of have this, they're off on the outside, they're nice land, they're kind of away from the kind of main hubbub of, oh, we have to be the biggest publisher and the biggest game in the universe, all that stuff. It's that kind of thing where we find frustration looking at EA and look at Ubisoft to an extent and Activision Blizzard going, we need more. We will not be happy until we are games. We are the game industry. We want to be the biggest fish in the pond, eat all the fish, shit out their bones. We will be, you know, kind of the Conan the Barbarian kind of conquerors of, of it. And that's in, like a noble enough goal or whatever else. But it's like funny to see these people just like in the corner going, we make Eve. We, we really would like to make something new. But we're kind of struggling there because that's like the problem of like being satisfying enough in your niche. Because even then that's like, it's a difficult niche to explain to people as well. Eve, like as soon as you make easy, Eve easier to get into, then Eve loses what it is. Yes, that's it. And that's one of the problems where you're like, well, then you have to go do something else. Like, what do you do? The shooter angles, maybe if it works, maybe that's good. You get people into the Eve universe. But then you, you don't even go Eve like, Eve is like a, you know, like an IP. Because it's not. You don't go, right, we need an Eve TV show and an Eve series of books, even though they would probably be pretty okay. And you could build something. It's so like sandboxy and player driven. It's not like this like super corporate media thing, where you expect you know all oh, yeah here's all of our transmedia narrative stuff and how can we ex how can we capitalize on this IP and bring in VC money to you know make tons of profit all this. It's just it's just a good it's just a good ass game that's being supported. You're like, well I guess I have to. Well so that's the thing. Do they have to figure out something or can they, can they be happy enough with it? That's one of the things I've always, from the outset, I've always looked at CCP and went, God, you have a great, you have a great job here, boys. You just sat there making Eve and going, what are you doing? Making Eve, yeah. What else are we doing? Ah, I guess we're experimenting elsewhere with, like, no real major risk. Just kind of chilling and having fun as developers. At least that's what it seemed like to the outside. Almost like a less, uh, a less money printing version of Valve, in a weird way. But having heard about them, you know, bringing in World of Darkness and failing, maybe it puts a bit of a darker light on that. 
a little bit more of they want to do stuff, but they can't. And it's certainly a very, a very fascinating look at a publisher that's just in the corner doing stuff. A different, a different flavor of story from the usual. Yeah. Which I think it's very, honestly, like I said, fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. Ultimately, I wish them the best and I suppose, mm. ha, right. How do you think they could do something different that's uniquely CCP mm. within the EVE universe that is a shooter? I guess I'd just like to know what you think. Um, I'm interested in what this company makes because I think EVE Online is one of the most interesting games ever created by our species. Hmm. Like, you know, you put it in those terms, like, <laughs> yeah. EVE legitimately is one of the most interesting games in history. And they've made that. Hmm. I just wonder what they could do in other uh, other areas. So, look, let me know, especially if you're an EVE player too. And uh, with that, have a good one. We'll see you next time.